Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World is brought to you by the Star Quest Production Network and is made possible by our many generous patrons. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. You're listening to episode 227 of Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World, where we look at mysteries from the twin perspectives of faith and reason. In this episode, we're talking about spoon bending. I'm Dom Bettinelli, and joining me today is Jimmy Akin. Hey, Jimmy. Howdy, Dom. In the 1970s, Israeli psychic entertainer Yuri Geller became an international sensation. One of the things he was famous for was going on television and radio and causing spoons, forks, and keys to bend. He'd invite people in the audience to check their own keys and silverware, and they reported them bending as well. Since Geller made the practice popular, it's been looked at by parapsychological researchers and metallurgists. Starting in the 1980s, the researcher began holding PK parties, or spoon-bending parties, and the practice of holding them continues today. Thousands of people have bent silverware and other objects, sometimes in amazing ways. So what's the truth about spoon-bending? Does it really involve mind over matter, or is it all a hoax? Well, that's what we'll be talking about on this episode of Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World. Jimmy, what should we say to begin? Well, this should be a very interesting story for listeners, in part for because there's a twist that will occur later in the episode, but I'll reserve what that is for now. So when did you first become aware of spoon bending? I guess it was in the 1970s when Yuri Geller was touring the United States. I had some awareness of him and his tour. Uh, I remember looking at his book in a bookstore. I don't remember the first time that I heard of psychic metal bending, but it, it must have been at that time because it was a pop culture phenomenon. And I found a clip of Yuri bending some keys in front of an audience in Washington state. Uh, this clip is from the absolutely ridiculous 1976 documentary Overlords of the UFO, which is a real hoot to watch. So we'll have a link to it. But here's part of Yuri's performance. In the video clip, Yuri is holding two key rings, uh, which he says are not his own. He's holding them in his hands, palms up, and he has a boy put his hands over them, palms down. And they're trying to get the keys to bend without using physical force on them. While hundreds watched and thousands more listened on radio station KVI, the city of Seattle witnessed the power of biological energy in an even more convincing form. This is what I want you to do. I'm holding these keys in my hand very, very gently. And what I want you to do, Ken, is put your hands on these keys, cover them, and start with cover these ones. No, not very, very gently like that, and the other one. Now, this is what I do. The that's helping Uri um, have his so hands covering the keys under the palms of now. Uri's hands. And uh, by the way, these keys are not mine. And I'm concentrating now, and I want something to happen. Can you feel anything in any hand? Tell me. If you feel any any tingling sensation or heat or... Where do you feel here? The keys are in Uri's hands. The little boy is holding his hands over the keys, but... All right, now start concentrating, Ken. What, and what you will have to do is you have to say, Ben, I hope you have enough feeling there, because I don't know how long this will take. Uri's hands are flat. His thumbs are up in the air where everybody can see them. Something is happening here. And he, say, he thinks something is happening. He has now discarded the keys in his left hand. The boy still is covering the keys in Uri's right hand. Uri, incidentally, is left-handed. Okay, put, put them. Now lift, lift your, your hand. hand. Again, lift your hand. Do you see any keys no. bending? I see one. Oh, yes, this is yeah. bending. One key. Wait a minute, I'm having to show this to the TV. Yeah, this key is going. Yeah, wait a minute. I... Yes, definitely. It's a big, thick, brass schlag or schlager type of key. I don't know what this just key Just like is the for. one he met last night you for see us. what I'm doing is I'm choking it very, very gently, and yeah, it's curling up more. I don't know you see that, Ken? Can see it. It's really happening, it's huh? It's bending even more. Yeah, this will curl up a little more here. Um, you see, I'm putting an energy into it. Can you see this from the... <laughs> there's no play, and there's absolutely no heat. Can touch the key, and you'll see the touch and under, or under where it's been. Do you feel any heat? There's absolutely no You do feel it. But there's, no, but there's really no heat. It's, uh, you touch it. I mean, you, you yeah. can see yeah. there's really heat on 
no. no it's just the, the, the body warmth. Body warm, the body warmth. And it's feeling. continuing to bend. I just want to show the camera. Can you see that? <laughs> They then asked other people, both in the live studio audience and in the radio audience, to check and see if their keys were also bending, and some reported that they were. To back up the biological energy demonstration, Geller called on others in the audience to check for keys which may also have responded to the presence of Geller's energy. The Seattle Post-Intelligencer told the story of hundreds of radio listeners whose keys mysteriously began bending right in their pockets. In the audience, there were others who found themselves a terminal for the newly demonstrated source of power. Keys in the audience belonging to people here were bending. And uh, we've seen keys a couple of women have shown in which are beginning to bend. There's, uh, here's a, a lady who is gray-haired, and she's just handed him a key. That is bent. And it is beginning to bend, very slightly, but noticeably. It's unreal, because you know what's unbelievable here? That usually the kids that are coming to me, that their keys bend, and usually it happens to children. Why? Uh, because children are more open-minded to this. I mean, look, these keys, look at these keys are totally bent. Would you say that it's uh, necessary for a person to believe they can bend yes. before they will bend? You see, a child believes that he's, he can bend the key because he's just totally innocent to it. So what do you make of this performance? Frankly, I'm not impressed. Uh, Yuri says that these aren't his keys, but the video doesn't show him getting them from a volunteer in the audience. And if he had just gotten them from someone in the audience, he wouldn't have had to say, by the way, these are not mine. Uh, so because the audience already would have known that. So the origin of the keys is unclear to the audience, or he wouldn't have had to say that. Um, he could have easily got, I mean, he might have gotten them from one of the, you know, TV people or something like that, but he didn't get them in front of the audience. And so he could have easily surreptitiously bent one of the keys before putting them in his palm. And then when uh, the kid says that he sees one of the keys bending, it's one of the keys that was on the back of the keychain, not one in the front where the boy would have had an easy view of it at the start of the demonstration. So Yuri could have been surreptitiously hiding that key in the back at the beginning and then let the kid see it at the end. Yuri uh, starts rubbing the key at the point where it's bent and he says it's continuing to bend, but it doesn't look to me like it's continuing to bend. Instead, it looks like Yuri is just tilting the key upward from a horizontal position. And as he does that, he partially covers the base of the key with a finger. So you only see the tip of the key, which is now pointing at a steeper angle because of how he's holding it. So that it looks like it's bending based on the part of the key you can see. But when he holds up the entire key for the camera, it looks like it's bent at exactly the same angle it was at the beginning. So I don't think this key bent at all while he was rubbing it. He's just saying that it did and using sleight of hand to create the illusion. They then say that another key is on the ring is bending, but I don't see that happening either. If it's bent at all, it's not bent as dramatically. And given the obscure origin of the keys, Yuri could have surreptitiously bent that as well. What do you make of Yuri Geller? Is he a genuine psychic or just a fraud using magician's tricks? I haven't yet studied Yuri Geller in detail, so I don't have a firm opinion on that. Um, but there's another possibility. It's possible that he's a genuine psychic who also uses magic tricks. This is a known phenomenon in parapsychology because psychic functioning is supposed to be difficult and unreliable. And celebrity psychics in particular can be afraid of failing in front of others because they've got a reputation to maintain. So if they're not under carefully controlled conditions, they may use magician's tricks to make things easier on themselves and avoid embarrassing themselves and harming their reputation. Going back to the 19th century, there have been celebrity psychics who have admitted this to parapsychologists saying, hey, you know, being genuinely psychic is hard. It's a lot easier to cheat than to be psychic, and I will cheat if you let me. How have parapsychologists reacted to that? 
It depends. Uh, one reaction that some parapsychologists have had is to say, well, OK, I just won't use celebrity psychics anymore. I'll test ordinary people who don't have a psychic reputation they need to maintain and who probably don't know magic tricks. And when they've done that, they've still reported finding evidence of psychic functioning, though not at the same level that famous psychics are supposed to be able to achieve. Other parapsychologists have been willing to keep testing celebrity psychics and really rigorously controlling the experiments to exclude cheating. And they also have reported finding evidence of psychic functioning under tightly controlled laboratory conditions. When it comes to Yuri Geller, I once asked parapsychologist Lloyd Auerbach about him. Uh, we talked to Lloyd in episode 210 on the Haunted House of Marin County, and Lloyd's opinion was that uh, Yuri fell into this mixed category of someone who does sometimes cheat, but who also can display psychic functioning in controlled settings. In his book, Mind Over Matter, Lloyd writes, The main question surrounding Yuri Geller has been whether he was or is a skilled magician or fraud, or whether he has genuine psychic abilities, though of course he could fit in both categories. I have heard reports from observers of Yuri Geller, both believers and disbelievers, many of whom were skilled observers. I have seen videotapes of some demonstrations on TV talk shows. I watched him do an ESP task on a local talk show in San Francisco several years ago, after which I got to meet him for the first time. I spent some time with him at his estate in England in 1991, where I got to know him better. I've had lengthy discussions with people who know him very well, as well as with debunkers who take the opportunity to disdain his abilities at every mention of his name. The best answer I can give to the above question is that Yuri Geller is a wonderful entertainer who sometimes displays psychic abilities. And perhaps that's what Yuri Geller is, though, as I said, I haven't studied him enough personally to have a solid opinion at this point. In the clips we heard, it wasn't just Yuri who reported keys bending. Other members of the live audience and the radio audience did as well. What do you make of that? Well, there are possible natural explanations for this, like people in the audience suddenly noticing that one of their keys has been, and they just never realized it before because it had been accidentally bent at some point in the past by purely natural causes, and they just never noticed before now. Or some people might falsely claim that one of their keys was bent just to get in on the fun. But both explanations only go so far, and they won't apply to that many people. You know, there's not going to be that many people who have a bent key that they've never noticed was bent. Um, and not that many people are going to, you know, hoax a key bending just for a moment of fun. Um, and lots of people have reported metal items that they own bending after watching or listening to one of Yuri's performances. This has led some people to propose that whether or not Yuri is doing anything psychic in his performances, he is encouraging people to believe in the possibility of psychic functioning. And that belief then gives people permission to use their own psychic abilities. So they end up using their own psychokinesis or mind over matter to bend items without realizing it. And that's a possibility that has to be considered. If psychic functioning is real, then it doesn't matter whether Yuri Geller is a total fraud or whether he has some genuine ability. Other people will have genuine psychic ability and listening to Yuri could stimulate them to use it, resulting in them ended up ending up with psychokinetically bent objects. Has anyone tried exploring that possibility? Yes. After the Yuri Geller craze of the 1970s, an aerospace engineer for Boeing named Jack Houck decided to test the idea. Hauk had an interest in the paranormal, which he investigated in his free time, and in January of 1981, Hauk decided to hold a party to see whether people could do the kinds of things that Yuri Geller was reported to do. This was the first event like this he held, and today these events are known as PK parties, PK standing for psychokinesis. They're also known as spoon-bending parties, since spoons are commonly used, and they're known as metal bending parties since it isn't just spoons that are used. Parapsychologists have proposed that one of the reasons we don't see a lot of psychic functioning happening around us all the time is that people in our culture are afraid of it. 
Um, it violates our secular, commonsensical intuitions about how the world works. And so people can freak out when they see it happening, and they freak out even more if they're the ones doing it. There are reports, for example, of people being tested in a lab for psychokinesis, and the person is trying to move an object with their mind. But when they do, and the object visibly starts moving, the person freaks out and the object stops moving. Um, even though they were trying to move it, it's so surprising when it happens that they're startled and it stops. So most people have an inhibition against doing this kind of thing. And to overcome that inhibition, Jack Houck got the idea of having a party where people are excited and having fun and acting in an uninhibited manner. So maybe that would let them drop their inhibition against using PK. He writes, In January 1981, I decided to have a party wherein people could learn how to perform psychokinesis. I gathered 21 people in my home in Huntington Beach, California. I had stopped at the Sears Company hardware department on the way home that night and purchased a 5 16th inch steel rod that I could not bend with all my strength. I said to myself, boy, if that gets bent, I will be impressed. At the first PK party, we were sitting in a circle, and I had passed out my grandparents' antique silverware. It has all been dedicated to science now. There was a lot of giggling and laughter because I do not think people believed that this was really going to happen. I don't think that I thought it was going to happen either. However, I was testing this conceptual model and had to follow through with the experiment. All of a sudden, a 14-year-old boy had the fork he was holding begin to have the head slowly fall over. He started screaming and yelling. He jumped out of his chair. That got everyone's attention so that everyone in the room saw the fork bending over. As I looked around the room, everyone's eyes were huge as they stared at this boy's fork. All of a sudden, other people found that the silverware they were holding became soft in their hands. They later described it as if the metal became a little warm and felt like putty in their hands. It seems to lose its structure for a few seconds. The metal stays soft for between 5 and 30 seconds. Here they were, finding what is normally nice, hard silverware becoming soft and structureless in their hands. Most of the people in the room then began to wildly bend up the silverware. They were screaming and yelling, and this was a real peak emotional event occurring in my living room. In the middle of all this pandemonium, I reached back to my dining room table and grabbed the big steel rod, handing it to the 14-year-old boy and said, Bend this. He looked at me and said, I can't do that. Then I said, don't ever say can't. That's like putting a block in your mind. He agreed to try, and after about five minutes, I again heard him yelling. He was jumping up and down in the middle of the living room. With no more force than simply moving his hands while holding the rod over his head, he bent that rod into a 270-degree turn. The next day, I rushed over to the Sears store and bought all the rest of the rods that size in their bin and took them into the laboratory. We had the head metallurgist try to physically bend one of the similar rods. He was a big man, about 200 pounds. He was not able to bend the rod until he finally bent it over his knee, using all of his might, red-faced and all. Seeing the difference between the young man doing it with no apparent effort at the PK party and the big metallurgist using a tremendous effort to bend it physically really impressed me. And the first PK party was quite successful. Hauk writes, there were only two people at the first PK party who did not achieve what I now call kindergarten bending. One was a lady who had told a friend of hers that she did not see any sense in bending silverware. It was as if she put up a mental block. The other person who did not bend was so busy analyzing what was going on that he didn't succeed either. So of the 21 people at the party, 19 of them, or 90% of the attendees, were able to bend the objects seemingly without applying the level of force you'd ordinarily need to do that. Hauk referred to what they were doing at this party as kindergarten bending. What's that? Hauk eventually developed three stages of metal bending, which he referred to as kindergarten bending, high school bending, and graduate school bending. As the name suggests, they're progressively harder and more impressive. So at the PK parties he held, They'd start with kindergarten bending and let people have success with that. Then they'd move on to high school bending, and finally they would attempt grad school bending. Hauk describes kindergarten bending this way. 
In kindergarten bending, you use two hands and apply about one-tenth the pressure necessary to bend the silverware physically. Almost everyone can bend silverware physically. However, in kindergarten metal bending, we're using both hands so that you will learn to find the time when the metal loses its structure, gets soft, and becomes a little warm. Then you will be aware of the difference between what it takes to bend the metal physically and with PK. So in kindergarten bending, you're doing something that you could do by brute force, but you're not using the level of force you'd normally have to. Instead, you concentrate on trying to make the metal get soft and warm, and then you bend it without using a lot of force. Hauk described this as warm forming the metal, because when the metal gets warm, you then form it into a new shape. And part of the point of kindergarten bending is learning when the metal is ready to bend, because that is the point at which you need to act. Hauk explains, it only stays soft for between 5 and 30 seconds, so it is important to really go at it for the few seconds that the metal is soft and has lost its structure. Also, you will feel the metal freeze or reharden. The grain boundaries re-solidify, and the result is that the soft metal abruptly gets hard again. So once you've figured out the point at which the metal is ready to bend in the kindergarten stage, you're then ready to move on to one of the higher stages. And that brings us to high school bending. What does that involve? Basically, high school bending involves bending an object in a way that you could not do with ordinary physical strength. Hauk explains, High school bending is when you bend something that is not possible with normal physical strength. During my PK party lecture, I always show examples of high school bending. These are metal rods, typically 3 8 inch extruded aluminum rods, that have been formed into odd shapes and steel rods up to a half inch that have been bent. Small ladies can bend the half inch rods. I even have some old fashioned hacksaw blades that have been formed into spirals. Usually, if too much physical force is applied to the old fashioned hacksaw blades, they break in multiple pieces because they're so brittle. One of the things we do in high school bending is buckle the bowls of silver plated spoons. These spoon bowls are part of a shell structure which makes them very difficult to buckle with physical force. I originally took a bunch of these spoons down to my tennis club and had some of the big jocks try to buckle the bowls. Not one buckled. That was when I was convinced that this is a difficult task to perform physically. However, at the PK parties, a lot of people buckle the silver plated spoon bowls. So high school bending involves doing things like bending metal rods that you ordinarily don't have the strength to bend, bending hacksaw blades that are too brittle to bend, and bending the bowls of silver-plated spoons that have a structural shape that makes them super hard to bend using ordinary force. After Hauk would have people performing high school bending, he'd have them attempt graduate school bending. What did that involve? Well, he explains, Graduate school bending is where people hold the bottom of the handles of two dinner forks, one in each hand. Do not use the other hand to bend them in graduate school. The hope is that the forks have some stress put into them at the time of manufacture, and then that when this is relieved, the forks will bend by themselves. In graduate school, we hold these forks, one in each hand, and command them to bend. It's kind of silly sitting around shouting at the forks. Often they bend. One time at a PK party in downtown Los Angeles, there was a man staring intently at the fork in his right hand. From across the room, I saw the fork in his left hand bend over. He didn't see it. So I went over to him and said, did you see the fork in your left hand? He turned his head to look at it and said, wow, how did that happen? As he said that, the fork in his right hand bent over. He was really upset because he didn't get to see either one of them bend spontaneously. But the rest of us did. It is really convincing when you see the forks bend spontaneously. About 10% of the people who have attended PK parties have reported that at least one of their graduate school forks has bent spontaneously. So in grad school bending, you don't apply any physical force to the objects. You just hold them and concentrate on making them bend. This is the most difficult form of bending, and only about 10% of people manage to achieve it. How successful was Hauk with his PK parties? 
very successful. Uh, after the initial one in January 1981, he continued to hold them for the next 23 years. And he ended up holding 360 spoon bending parties in which over 17,000 people participated. And being an engineer, he kept records on them, including what percentage of people succeeded at the different levels. And he became known as one of the foremost experts on this phenomenon. What have other parapsychologists found on the topic? Lloyd Auerbach has participated in many spoon bending parties. This was in part in conjunction with JFK University in San Francisco, which for a time offered a degree in parapsychology. So they held quite a number of the parties. And the results could be impressive, even when skeptics were participating. In his book, Mind Over Matter, Lloyd writes, During one of the sessions, a staff member of JFKU brought along a friend who was highly skeptical and was a professional magician. During the session in which he participated, I observed him twisting a thick, solid aluminum rod. I recall it to be at least one inch thick. When I discussed this with him later, after he unsuccessfully tried with all his regular conscious strength, to bend it more or unbend it, I asked him how he thought the rod bent, if not by PK. He remarked that while he was rubbing the rod, the friction must have caused it to heat up, soften, and allow for him to easily bend it. When I pointed out to him that the melting point of aluminum was over 1,000 degrees, actually around 1,200 degrees Fahrenheit, and that his hands had no blisters, he had no explanation. But he said, it wasn't psychokinesis. I know that much. Another parapsychologist who has commented on this is Russell Targ. Uh, he's a physicist, and we first heard about him in episodes 102 and 103 on remote viewing. In his book, The Reality of ESP, A Physicist's Proof of Psychic Abilities, he indicates that he initially was not impressed with metal bending, but he ended up concluding that it is a form of psychokinetic functioning. He writes... Yuri Geller, the Israeli magician and psychic, visited our laboratory at Stanford Research Institute in the winter of 1972. Many people think that Geller is a total fraud and that he fooled us with his tricks, but that's not true. We have widely reported that Yuri did not bend any metal at SRI, and for two decades I denigrated the whole spoon bending craze as a kind of silliness. However, a few years ago I saw some metal bending that has changed my mind. I've seen lots of bent spoons, but never anything that appeared either significant or paranormal at these parties, at least not until 1999. As we were cleaning up after another disappointing event, we heard a shriek from the corner of the ballroom. It was my friend, Jane Katra, the spiritual healer. She had been sitting quietly meditating with a stainless steel teaspoon thrust into her fist when suddenly the spoon came alive in her hand and shocked her out of her reverie. She described the experience as suddenly feeling that there was a cricket wriggling against the palm of her hand. That's what made her scream. As several of us rushed over to see what had happened, we saw her staring at a very strange-looking spoon. While in her hand, the bowl of the spoon had curled or rolled up 180 degrees toward the handle. We photographed the spoon and put it into a plastic bag. By the time we reached home, the spoon had rolled up to 270 degrees and now looked like a little nautilus or snail shell. That is, the actual bowl of the spoon, not the handle, is what had rolled up. I can think of no way by manual force or laboratory technology that anyone could have accomplished this, certainly not Jane, who has small-boned little hands that have been bruised just by cutting roses. A month later, Jane and I had an opportunity to attend a second PK party. This time, I was successful in rising to the occasion and bending a 3 8 inch foot-long aluminum rod by about 30 degrees. As I sat with my eyes closed, meditating and holding the bar at its ends in my fingertips to avoid accidental unconscious force being applied, the bar just became springy in my hands and bent. I brought an identical bar home for my two athletic sons to try and bend. Neither of those tall, strong oarsmen could bend it at all. I'm not relating these stories to indicate any sp special psychic prowess on Jane's or my part. Rather, I think it is important finally to report that there is such a thing as paranormal metal bending and that it doesn't require Yuri Geller to do it. The corollary to this truth is that if we can bend metal at a PK party, then it is quite likely that Geller, who started this craze, can do it also. 
So in the first incident, Targ's friend Jane was attempting grad school level bending. She was holding a spoon by the handle and not touching the bowl of the spoon, but the bowl of the spoon rolled up 180 degrees towards the handle. And after they put it in a plastic bag, it continued to roll up to a 270 degree bend. Then at the second party, Targ himself was holding a 3 8 inch aluminum rod using his fingertips so as not to put force on it, but it bent by 30 degrees without him using any force, even though neither of his two athletic sons could bend an identical rod using physical strength. And so Targ became convinced that this was possible, despite his previous skepticism of metal bending. So there's definitely a phenomenon to investigate here. Before we get to our theories and our faith and reason perspectives, I want to take a moment to thank our patrons who make this show possible, including Tamara D., Aldana T., Lisa C., Anna D., and Gerard T. Their generous donations at sqpn.com slash give make it possible for us to continue Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World and all the shows at StarQuest. You can join them by visiting sqpn.com slash give. Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World is also brought to you by Fearvento Law PLLC, now assisting clients with expungements and set-asides of Michigan convictions. To learn more, call 231-202-3321 or go to fearventolaw.com, F-I-O-R-V-E-N-T-O law.com. And by delivercontacts.com, offering contact lenses at low prices, with free delivery, visit delivercontacts.com. Jimmy, what theories are there about PK metal bending? Basically, we need to consider two questions from the reason perspective. First, if PK metal bending is real, how is it supposed to work? And what do people think is going on? And second, what does the evidence say about whether it's real? Could it all just be due to natural causes or could some of it be psychic? We also need to look at this from the faith perspective. All right, let's start there. What can we say about PK metal bending from the faith perspective? Let's get one question out of the way up front. Could it be due to demons? Well, anything can be due to demons, but you need evidence if you want to propose that. You can't just let your fears run away with you and attribute everything you don't understand to demonic activity. As we talked about in episode 188 on whether it's always demons, there are lots of phenomena in nature that originally were not well understood, like gravity, which, when Isaac Newton first proposed it, was regarded as a magical force, since it involved spooky action at a distance that violated Aristotelian physics. But as the phenomenon was studied, it was gradually accepted, and even though we don't understand gravity today, I mean, we still don't have a good theory of exactly what it is, no evidence has emerged that it was caused by demons. Every phenomenon needs to be taken at face value until we have evidence that it should be taken in some other way, and gravity does not appear to be caused by demons. It appears to be a natural force, and you don't have to appeal to demons or spirits to get gravity to work. In the same way, as we discussed in episode 79 on religion, magic, psychic phenomena, and science, Psychic abilities present themselves as natural ones, meaning if they exist, they present themselves as part of human nature. You don't have to invoke spirits to get them to work. They appear to work by human nature alone. So for purposes of researching them, we should assume they are natural human abilities until we get evidence otherwise. And that would apply to psychokinesis or mind over matter as much as anything else. If you don't have to call on spirits for it to work, you should assume it's natural until you get evidence otherwise. And the idea of psychokinesis is not contrary to the faith. Not only does the church not have a teaching on psychokinesis, but doctors of the church, like St. Thomas Aquinas, have supported the idea of psychokinesis as a natural human ability. In fact, psychokinesis was St. Thomas's explanation for the evil eye, as we discussed in episodes 105 and 106 on St. Thomas Aquinas and the Occult. So in the case of metal bending, it presents itself as a natural phenomenon. You don't call on spirits to make it work. The church has no teaching on the topic, and doctors of the church, like Aquinas, have held that psychokinesis is built into human nature. 
And so for purposes of studying it, we should proceed on that basis until we get evidence to the contrary. Okay, then, what can we say about metal bending from the reason perspective? In parapsychology, what do people think is going on when it happens? Parapsychologists divide psychokinesis into two kinds, macro-PK and micro-PK. Macro-PK occurs when you can see the object, the movement of the object happening, like an object flying across a room due to a poltergeist. Micro-PK occurs when you can't see the movement happening, like influencing a random number generator on a computer. In that case, the psychokinesis would be affecting things on the atomic or subatomic scale in the random number generator, so that's too small to see. Metal bending sits on the border between macro PK and micro PK. On the one hand, you can see it because you can see the object bend, but on the other hand, what's really happening here? It's commonly thought that psychokinesis is affecting the object on the small scale, too small to see, like the microscopic grains of metal that the spoon or fork is made out of. So there's a micro PK element as well. Jack Hauck explains his theory about what's happening, which has to do with the boundaries in the grains of the metal. I think that the dislocations in the grain boundaries of the metal act as transducers to some unknown form of energy. The mind establishes a link between this energy source and energy is dumped into the grain boundaries. The energy has nowhere to go, so it turns into heat. This is the same process that happens with known energy that gets dumped inside of another material, as with neutrons, x-rays, and microwaves. This heat melts the grain boundaries, and the metal feels like it has lost its structure because the grains inside the metal slip with respect to each other. The heat is transferred away from the grain boundaries by normal conduction, and eventually the freezing point of the metal is reached, and the metal becomes hard again. The reason that the metal only feels warm is that the grain boundaries are very small compared to the size of the grains in the metal. So, Hauck's idea is that the person doing spoon bending is not psychokinetically causing the metal as a whole to melt. That's why it doesn't become liquid and totally burn your hand. Instead, he thinks that the person is causing the boundaries between the grains of metal to melt, and so they start to slip against each other, and the metal loses its structure and becomes soft without getting red hot and turning into a liquid. He thinks something similar happens when people try to bend plastic objects, and yes, he's also experimented with these and had success, bending plastic spoons and forks as well as metal ones. So that's Hauck's theory. What about other theories about spoon bending? What do skeptics say? Hardened skeptics, meaning those who reflexively reject the possibility of psychokinesis, have a number of explanations. One of them is fraud, because it's quite possible to use magic tricks to simulate paranormal spoon bending. You can find magic tutorials on YouTube explaining how to do spoon bending tricks, though most of them don't actually involve bending a spoon. Instead, a lot of them are bend and restore tricks where you seem to bend a spoon and then restore it to its original state. In those cases, you're not really bending the spoon. You're just using sleight of hand to make it look like the spoon has been bent, and then you reveal it in its unbent form making it look like it's been restored. For tricks that actually do involve bending a spoon or a fork or a key, the trick either involves pre-bending it before the trick starts, like Yuri Geller may have done with that key in the clip from the 1970s, or it involves surreptitiously bending it in the middle of the trick when people aren't looking or can't see, using a lot of physical force on the object all at once when people aren't noticing. That might explain what celebrity performers like Yuri Geller are doing, but that wouldn't apply to people at spoon-bending parties who aren't magicians. How do skeptics explain those cases? One possibility they propose is that the people are actually applying more force than they think they are. Uh, a lot of metal spoons and forks aren't that sturdy. For example, I have spoons whose handles are only a millimeter thick, and a millimeter is not a lot of metal. So if you're at a spoon bending party and you're excited and having fun, 
you might apply more force than you realize to a flimsy spoon or fork and bend it without realizing how much force you applied. What about the idea of heating the object up and causing it to bend that way? That's what Lloyd Auerbach's magician friend proposed when he bent the inch-thick aluminum bar. The idea of heat is also something that needs to be taken into consideration. If you hold an object in your hands, it will warm up to human body temperature, which is 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. If you gently rub it, you might get it a few degrees hotter than that. But if you tried to get it even hotter by rubbing it, you'd cause blisters and your skin would tear if you rubbed it hard enough to raise it more than just a few degrees. So by holding it in your hand and gently rubbing it, you could get it up to around 100 degrees Fahrenheit, but not much more than that. The only metal that has a melting point that low is gallium, or element 31, which melts at 85 degrees. In fact, practical jokers have been known to use gallium spoons that will melt when you use them to stir hot tea. This trick is known as the disappearing spoon. But gallium spoons are not practical to use for this very reason, and so ordinary spoons are made out of metals with much higher melting points like stainless steel, which has a melting point of around 2,700 degrees, or aluminum, which has a melting point of around 1,200 degrees, as Lloyd pointed out to his skeptical friend who bent the aluminum rod. An object doesn't have to get all the way to its melting point to become soft, though, as we talked about in episodes 171 and 172 on the 9-11 attacks. The metal beams in the World Trade Center didn't have to melt and become liquid, they just had to get hot enough that they started to become soft and could no longer hold up the weight of the skyscrapers. True. So I checked to see how much of their strength different metals lost based on their temperature. The website Engineering Toolbox has a handy graph of what happens to different metals as the temperature rises. They define a metal as having 100% of its strength at 70 degrees Fahrenheit or room temperature. And in the case of some metals, they actually get stronger as the temperature goes up from there before, at several hundred degrees, they start to lose strength again. Other metals start to lose strength immediately, but not that much. The question is, how much of their strength will these metals have at around 100 degrees Fahrenheit, the temperature that you could get them up to by body heat and gentle rubbing? In no case was there a significant drop in strength at that temperature. For example, stainless steel still had 95% or better of its strength at 100 degrees. So the temperature would only make it 5% easier to bend than at room temperature, which is not much of an effect. So I don't think we can see temperature changes as having a notable effect on the results of PK parties. Jimmy, have you ever participated in a PK party? Yes, I have, and that's the twist I promised at the beginning of the episode. I'd been interested in the possibility of observing a PK party for a while, and recently I had the chance to go to one. What's more, I can describe what happened when I tried to bend a spoon, so now I can speak from personal experience on the topic. Last July, I went up to Menlo Park, California for the annual convention of IRVA, the International Remote Viewing Association. I'd never been to such a convention before, but I went up this time as a research and networking trip, in part to meet people who I knew would be at the convention that could make good mysterious world guests, not all of which are remote viewers because they have other guests as well, including some who were active in the UFO UAP field. And what happened while you were at the conference? Well, I got to meet a bunch of people, uh, some of whom I'd previously met on the Internet and some of whom I'd never met before. I attended interesting talks and I performed at the first ever Irva Talent Show on Friday night doing several things. Uh, one was I helped out remote viewer Paul Smith, who we had on the show back in episodes 156 and 157, who had been convinced to play his guitar for the talent show. Uh, he wanted to play a couple of songs, but he didn't want to sing. And since I sing, I volunteered to help him out. One of the songs we performed was a country song from 1947, right after the UFO craze started, as we heard about in episode 46 on the Kenneth Arnold sighting and in episode 49 on the Roswell crash. The song was called You Better Pray to the Lord When You See Those Flying Saucers. 
I had never heard it before, and it's by a group called the Buchanan Brothers. And I want to give Paul credit for introducing me to it because it's really awesome. We'll have a link so you can listen to it for yourself. The other song was the most remote viewing classic rock song ever. The Who's I Can See for Miles and Miles. <laughs> and the crowd really loved that one. I invited the audience to sing the chorus with us. So you have this whole crowd of remote viewers enthusiastically belting out, I can see for miles and miles. <laughs> and, and Paul was right. That really is the most remote viewing classic rock song ever. So he picked a couple of really awesome songs that were great for the audience. Afterwards, at the end of the talent show, I got people up and called an energetic contra dance for them, which several people told me the next day was their favorite part of the show. Anyway, that was Friday night's entertainment, and I discovered that for Saturday night's entertainment, they were holding a spoon-bending party, so I went. And what happened at the party? Well, it got started late because they held a charity auction first, and that wasn't on the schedule. But the PK party was overseen by three remote viewers, Angela Thompson-Smith, Lynn Buchanan, and Paul Smith. The first thing that happened was Paul had us put a bunch of chairs into a semicircle so that we could sit facing each other. Uh, this would help build the group dynamic and create a more party-like environment as we could see each other's reactions and what success other people were having. We had about 30 people present, so it was a decent-sized party. I helped set out the chairs, and then Angela handed me a plastic bag with a bunch of bent spoons and forks and told me to hand them out. So I went around the semicircle and distributed them. And people were surprised that I was handing out cutlery that had already been bent. But I understood the purpose. It was to stimulate people's imagination and show them what's possible. So that's what I told them. Is we're handing this out to stimulate your imagination and show you what's possible. We all then um, went up to a couple of boxes of unbent spoons and forks that they had and selected one each. The personal selection was thought to be significant and part of the process of bonding, you bonding individually with this item that you're going to be bending. Uh, you're kind of taking ownership by selecting it yourself. And these were very substantial pieces of cutlery. They were not like the flimsy ones I have at home, you know, like spoons and forks that have just a one millimeter thick handle. In my case, I took a spoon that had a handle that was three times that thick or three millimeters thick. And it was made not of aluminum, but of stainless steel. And it was very hefty in my hand. I, you know, tugged on it and, you know, kind of tried bending it and found it was very resistant to bending. If I wanted to bend it normally, I would have to use a lot of force. The same was true of the other spoons and forks that they had. They were all very substantial. And in fact, I heard one of the organizers say to another organizer that these spoons and forks were too substantial for beginners, that they weren't really appropriate for people who had never done this before, but they were what we had to work with. So we did. Then Paul told a couple of jokes to get people in a festive party mood. And Angela showed a few slides and had some initial encouraging remarks. She said that we would be doing kindergarten bending, so we wouldn't be doing high school or grad school bending, just the easy stuff. And she mentioned that we would not be bending the bowls of the spoons as we didn't have the silver plated ones that are commonly used for that. She stressed that we could bend the ones we have and that in keeping with Jack Houck's statistics, 85 to 95 percent of us should be able to do so. And the only people who were closed to the idea of being able to bend could be expected to fail. So that was more confidence building on the organizer's part to get us in the right frame of mind. Then Lynn got up and gave us basic instructions for what to do. Basically, he said we were to think about the, our spoon or fork and we were to repeatedly shout bend, which is a standard thing at these parties. And Lynn gave us a demonstration of just how loud we were to shout, and it was very loud. He also said to keep shouting. When Lynn shouted bend really loud, he also visibly bent the piece of cutlery he was holding. He didn't pretend to do it paranormally. He just applied sudden force to it, 
which I understood as another confidence building measure to show that it was possible to bend these, just like when I handed out the pre-bend. Lynn said that when we feel the item start to get flexible, we should quickly bend it and then raise it over our heads and shout something like huzzah to let other people know we'd succeeded and thus encourage them. So more confidence building. What happened once the bending procedure started? Well, everyone started shouting bend, bend really loud, but my throat quickly got hoarse, so I had to gradually stop, and the guy sitting next to me had to do the same thing. So I just held the spoon in my hands and gently rubbed it at various points, including in the bowl, at the bend of the handle, and at another point on the handle where I thought it might bend. Lynn came by and saw that I was working on the spoon at several points, and he said to just work on it at one point where the handle connected to the bowl, which would be the easiest to bend. So I did that. After gently rubbing it for a few minutes, I could feel it getting warm, and Angela came by and asked to see it. She took it and said, this one is ready to go, and handed it back to me. I briefly rubbed it a little more, and it felt like it might be getting flexible, and then I bent it making a sharp turn, um, 180 deg 80 degree turn, so that the bowl was parallel with the handle of the spoon. In fact, the artwork for this episode is a picture of the spoon after I bent it, both before and after, so you can see it for yourself. Afterwards, like Jack Houck said, it quickly got hard and inflexible again. I tried forcing it into a new shape, but it wouldn't budge. So I raised it over my head and shouted huzzah to let others know I had succeeded. The next morning, I also tried tucking on it to see if I could get it to unbend, and I couldn't. It felt like if I applied enough force to unbend the handle that it would simply snap, so I left it alone. Having had the experience of bending a spoon yourself, what can you tell us about it? Do you think you were applying enough force to bend it naturally? Were you just in an excited party state where you might not have realized how much force you were applying? I definitely wasn't overcome by a party experience. Uh, I'm a very, I, number one, I don't like parties. But um, uh, number two, I'm a very analytical person. And I think analytically about everything that's happening around me. Uh, I already had knowledge of how spoon bending parties work. And I was consciously watching for and thinking about all of the things that Angela, Lynn, and Paul were doing to get people in the right mood. So I was actually somewhat emotionally distant from that. I definitely was not emotionally caught up in the experience, and I don't even remember other people shouting when they had success. I was just focused on what I was doing. But I was open to the idea of having it happen, and I followed Lynn's instructions to focus on just one point instead of multiple points on the spoon. And when Angela said my spoon was ready to go, I did apply some force, but not as much as I thought would ordinarily be needed. Afterwards, the spoon became hard and I could not uh, get it to keep bending at that level of force. And the next day, it seemed that it, that it would have snapped if I applied enough force to bend it. Also, what I can tell you is that the spoon got warm in my hands. Uh, it became flexible enough that I could bend it using less force than I thought would have been necessary, and afterwards it went back to being normal. As a result, I'm not 100% convinced that this was a paranormal event, but I also can't fully explain it, so I'm open to the idea that it was. Your own experience at a spoon bending party is notable, but it isn't fully objective. Is there anything that you can point us to that is more objective? One possibility is metallurgical analysis of spoons and other objects that have been bent using this method. Jack Houck's theory that the warm forming of these objects is significantly different than what would happen if you bent them using conventional force. If the boundaries be between metal grains became fluid, that would produce different effects under a microscope than for objects that had been bent with conventional force. Jack Houck uh, subjected some of the bent objects from his parties to metallurgical analysis, and he discusses the results of those studies on his website. But in Mind Over Matter, Lloyd Auerbach summarizes. Houck had a metallurgist analyze samples from the sessions, and it was reported that there appeared to be a difference in the molecular structure of pieces of metal bent by pressure or force and those that were apparently paranormally bent. 
the boundaries in the structure where the grains of metal touched were fractured and torn in the normal sample, yet somehow melted or even vaporized in the paranormal sample. The metallurgical analyses indicate that when PK does occur, it affects the microscopic structure of the metal. But by the working definition of mind over matter, when the mind somehow enhances the body in a way that a piece of metal, too strong to be bent by the individual normally, can be bent, something on the order of PK is going on. So Hauk's metallurgist reported that there was a difference between items that had been warm formed in PK parties and those that had been bent by conventional means. So, Jimmy, what is your bottom line about spoon bending? I think metal bending is an interesting phenomenon that may be paranormal in nature. Yuri Geller may be a partial or total fraud, but even if he's a total fraud, that doesn't explain the results of the spoon bending parties that Jack Hauk pioneered, which have involved countless people reporting success. Speaking from my own experience, I worked on a very substantial spoon, not a flimsy one like I have in my silverware drawer at home. I could not have heated it to much more than 100 degrees Fahrenheit, at which point the stainless steel of which the spoon was made would have retained 95% or more of its strength. So heat was not a significant factor in what I was able to do with it. Yet it became flexible enough in my hands that it bent, even though I wasn't applying the force to it, I ordinarily would have thought I would need to, to make it bend. And afterwards, it became hard, and I couldn't bend it the same way again. Furthermore, Hauk's findings reportedly show a metallurgical difference between warm-formed objects and those that have been bent by brute force. So I think there's a phenomenon here that deserves to be investigated. I think some of my wife's silverware is going to go missing soon because I'm going to try this myself. Uh, So, Jimmy, what further resources can we uh, offer to the viewer and listener? We'll have a link to Lloyd Auerbach's book, Mind Over Matter. Also, Russell Targ's book, The Reality of ESP, A Physicist's Proof of Psychic Abilities. Jack Houck's website, uh, a paper that Houck wrote about PK parties. Also, the heat effects or the effects of heat on metal from Engineering Toolbox. Uh, the 1976 ridiculous documentary Overlords of the UFO. Man, it is so crazy. <laughs> um, also, the Buchanan Brothers song, You Better Pray to the Lord When You See Those Flying Saucers from 1947. And the Who's song, I Can See for Miles and Miles. Awesome. Very good. So, uh, Jimmy, what mysterious headlines can we offer to the listener this week? Well, uh, recently in episode 220, we did an episode on Eucharistic miracles. And subsequent to that, a Eucharistic miracle made the news and it's reported to have occurred in Mexico. It hasn't been evaluated by the diocese. And this was a visual miracle. It wasn't a transformation miracle, you know, where the um, uh, where the host becomes a piece of heart tissue you know, like we talked about in episode 220. So this was a bit of a different kind of Eucharistic miracle, but we'll have a link to where you can read about it. Also, in uh, Mysterious Headlines previously, we talked about xenobots, which are um, robots made out of living cells. And so it's kind of xenobots are kind of living robots. Well, now scientists have gone and made necrobots, which are robots made out of dead cells. Specifically, scientists turned dead spiders into zombie spider robots. So, um, (laughs) so yeah, zombie spider robots are now a thing and you can read all about it and we'll have a link. Why, Lord? Why? (laughs) What were they thinking? Have they not seen any movies? (laughs) (laughs) This is Plan 9 from Outer Space with spiders instead of humans. (laughs) (laughs) No kidding. Oh, yeah. Can't imagine anything worse. All right. So that's it from us this time. We would love to hear your theories about spoon bending. You can let us know by visiting sqpn.com or the Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World Facebook page. Send us an email to mysterious at sqpn.com sending a tweet to at mys underscore world in the StarQuest Discord community at sqpn.com slash discord or calling our mysterious feedback line at 619-738-4515. That's 619-738-4515.
And I want to say a special word of thanks to Oasis Studio 7 for the video and animation work they did on this episode, as well as all the other episodes of Mysterious World. You can see their work by going to youtube.com slash Jimmy Aiken. And they do a really great job. If you have a need for video editing work or animation work to be done, be sure and uh, contact them. Also, while you're at my YouTube channel at youtube.com slash Jimmy Aiken, I am trying to grow it. I hope to get it soon to 50,000 subscribers, but that'll only happen with your help. So please, while you're there, uh, be sure and subscribe and hit the bell notification so that you always get a notice whenever I do a video, whether it's Mysterious World or something else. So, Jimmy, what are we going to be talking about next time? Next week is the 60th anniversary of the Cuban Missile Crisis of 1962. We already talked about the main Cuban Missile Crisis back in episodes 213 and 214. So next week, we'll be talking about the second secret Cuban Missile Crisis, the one that America and the world didn't know anything about. Mm, excellent. Folks, be sure to get your very own Mysterious World t-shirt, mug, and more in many different colors so there are, that are available in our merchandise shop at sqpn.com slash merch, M-E-R-C-H. You can find links to Jimmy's resources from our discussion and links to those mysterious headlines on our show notes at mysterious.fm slash 227. And remember, to help us continue to produce the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World is also brought to you in part through the generous support of our sponsors, including Aaron Ferguson Electric and Automation at AaronV.com. A-A-R-O-N-V dot com. Making connections for life for your automation and smart home needs in North and Central Florida. And by Catechism Class, a dynamic weekly podcast journey through the Catechism of the Catholic Church by Greg and Jennifer Willits. It's the best book club, coffee talk, and faith study group all rolled into one. Find it in any podcast directory. Until next time, Jimmy Aiken, thank you for exploring with us our mysterious world. Thanks, Tom. And once again, I'm Dom Bettinelli. Thank you for listening to Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World on StarQuest. Hey, you'd better.